Um, ladies and gentlemen, Florian, thank you very much for having me here. It's more than a pleasure for me. Uh, and it's a rare situation that a businessman is standing in front of um, highly calibrated intellectual capacities. And, and you might think, uh, what kind of role do I and take here on, on, on that uh, podium. Now, I've decided to share with you some thoughts, some considerations I have from my point of perspective of um, being responsible in an environment which is dominated by global logistics, be it in a shipping line, be it in a, a forwarding business like Kühn and Nagel. And um, if I want to um, start in, in addressing the, the theme of um, today's workshop, on how to do uh, business amidst the globalization backlash, uh, there's already an implication with it, an implication that there is a globalization backlash. And um, I dare to um, confess that I am not believing in a backlash, and I want to convince you at least to follow one of um, those thoughts which um, put me into that um, judgment. The term globalization is often used to describe the developments since uh, the beginning of industrialization in the 19th century, which goes hand in hand with a massive increase in global trade. But the globalization story actually, from my point of view, started much earlier and is, it is not just a result of a groundbreaking new technology like the train, like the ship um, itself. Uh, it's by far a more fundamental trend, looking at globalization as something that is probably deeply rooted in our DNA, would help to reposition the globalization phenomenon as a natural continuum, not as something that can be turned on or off. Many interesting books have been written about the history of globalization. However, the current public debate around this topic would benefit from reflections on long-term and longer term developments in order to see and create new alternatives going forward. The globalization continuum has been fueled by trade and logistics, of course. But next to trade that can be measured, globalization happens and impacts what I call our soft tissues. Take any aspect of human life, cultures, fashion, languages, religions, economic systems, you name it. All of this is contributing to the continuum of globalization. Communities and nations have changed by integrating people from other communities with other value systems. We have shared that already in, in the morning session a little bit. And every friendship, every marriage, every new business relationship contributes to narrowing cultural and other gaps. Our soft tissue is definitely becoming global, not regional, not local, and certainly not domestic. Looking at the level of globalization, we have experienced an unprecedented development in terms of speed since World War II, but we are still far away from a truly global economy or a global system. Based on various indicators regarding global connectedness in terms of flow of goods, finance, what Beatrice was reflecting on, people and even information, we have a huge potential for further global integration. Today's level of globalization is therefore far less advanced than one might think. Even experienced business people overestimate the intensity of global integration. At least I was very much impressed by um, Professor Gemavat um, from um, Harvard Business um, in his um, book World um, 3.0. But it is a strong force that is growing fast, if not exponentially exponentially. I'm convinced that the current developments and increases in protectionist measures are not signals of a stop or changing gears into reverse, but events of conflicts to shape the next phase of globalization. Essentially, I see globalization as a function and state, and as a state of full equilibrium of the usage and distribution of natural resources, of energy, which includes water, air, and labor. And it is interesting um, to note that these factors have not been covered yet. Um, but for me, as a businessman, I'm sometimes wondering how these goods, water, air, and labor, are incorporated 
and our um, ideas about talking um, about the globalization. And at the end of the day, it's purchasing power and the markets as selectors and off and feedback loops for relevant products and services. This is what we see in the data and interaction with our customers. At Kühne & Nagel, we provide logistics and transport services around the world. We do it with more than 70,000 people and more than 1,300 locations globally. Based on our up-to-date knowledge of global markets, our market leader position in sea freight, and sea freight stands for 90% of global trade, um, and international trade flows, we are often asked, and we ask ourselves, what is going on in that world and what kind of information do we need in order to plan um, decently and to support our customers. And therefore, it was a logical step for me when three years ago we combined our logistic knowledge um, with propriety and external data and to offer the resulting market intelligence as a new service to customers from the financial and logistics sectors. Three years ago, we started this project and created our own data product, Global Kuhn and Nagel Indicators, which provides early insights into changes, turning points and disturbances in world trade. Key economic indicators, such as imports and export statistics, are available are available, available, sorry, available 60 days before the official statistics and up to 55 days earlier than other estimates. We know already when a customer is calling us in China that they are asking for an export of a tool and, um, and, for, and heading for Los Angeles, we know that this initial step is getting an in route into the statistics six weeks down the road. And this puts us in a perfect position in order to predict, in order to judge, and in order to observe um, certain flows. And what we see at the moment reminds me of other times when globalization was meant to be in retreat. Take the period of the Great Depression in the 30s, for example. Referring to Kemal Watt's account in his book World 3.0, or his latest Harvard Business Review article, it is obvious that even during these grim times, trade volume was by far less in decline than generally perceived. In other words, trade persisted and resisted when our world was in gloom. Um, I want to share with you some of these data points we are able to gather uh, out of uh, our business. And even and though Mr. Trump is building walls along um, the Mexico frontier, that's what we can observe. And here, first of all, you see um, the China trend, where we have indicated the exports in, in blue and, and the imports in red. We definitely see that there's no indication at all by talking about China and, and considering a backlash. The same is applicable for the US, where everybody might um, think and that and due to the um, public discussion around um, connectivity, isolation, um, and, and all these issues that we might consider and backlash, but you see um, the year-on-year -year, um, curve. Um, once again, export as well as import is very stable on um, what we call, would call um, the dynamic of globalization. Kimawatz and other economic researchers claim is reflected in our own data. Globalization is definitely not in backlash mode. The overheated growth of the last decade has cooled down and starts showing a much more sustainable development. And Beatrice was reflecting on the same fact we are showing here, um, that the uh, trade volume growth and the world real GDP has been disturbed um, seriously in the um, 2009, 2008, 2009 financial crisis but then came back into a balance uh, which still stands for around 1.0 uh, um, in terms of um, uh, world GDP growth and, and comparison to world trade. Um, and actually, um, the, the data we are able to look at um, uh, possibly taken on a global scale as well as on a um, um, by country by country scale, which helps us to supply certain uh, capacities um, and to certain regions. But even realizing 
Okay, but even realizing we need to take the anti-globalization discourse extremely serious, it is the expression of real and perceived fear of a growing number of people to lose their current status quo or to be pushed to the lower end of our societies. Riding on the back of these fears allows politicians to drive home easy points supporting nationalistic and protectionist trends, and we have experienced that in France, in Germany, and not only in the US. Protectionist claims are not viable options or remedies against these fears. The social, economic and environmental challenge we are facing transcend national borders and can only be solved by further integration, also or even more so at global level. But now let's talk about doing business in such an environment. As a company that has been thriving and benefiting from globalization and as a result has become a global player in terms of people and locations, we are also very susceptible and exposed to respective local changes. The volatility and speed at which the system of globalization creates new challenges for us um, in this environment is extraordinary. There are many aspects to consider, but in the context of our panel this afternoon, I would like to focus on three, complexity, diversity and resources. First about complexity. Like many other businesses, logistics and transportation has undoubtedly become more complex. What usually starts as a simple conversation between a shipper and a consignee ends in an exchange of information within a highly complex system, combining the flow of physical goods, information related to that flow to the exchange of financial values. In other words, that's what we call trade. Successful trade at company level requires the ability to read the relevant signals in a swelling ocean of data and to act amidst the often conflicting data. New and better technologies are creating new levels of complexity. How do you take the right short, mid and long term decision in such an environment? Secondly, diversity. The global trade engine, fueled by rising purchasing power of the middle class, has not created global classes of homogeneous consumers. Actually, I, I'm only aware of three truly global products which are existing. That's the Big Mac, that's the Coca-Cola bottle, and that's the iPhone. No other product is exactly in the same manner delivered globally. So globalization is definitely not at its end. It's at the very first beginning. If you might have other products which you would consider or which you would call global um, um, in mind, please give me a note because then I would um, um, incorporate that into my, uh, my next um, speeches. But at the moment, I'm really um, um, I'm stuck um, with these three examples I, I just shared with you. Another key aspect of diver diversity relates to the composition of our workforce in a localized environment. I'm not, in not so many years from now, the majority of our workforce at Kudenagel will be located in Asia, South America, Middle East and Africa. Definitely not in Switzerland, definitely not in Europe. Thirdly, resources. The recent and devastating hurricanes in the Americas and elsewhere have brought back the discussion on climate change and extraction and consumption of fossil fuels. What is our role as business leader in this regard, especially if you're making money on transporting, primarily with fossil fuels, goods from A to B. The consequence of all these dynamics is determined by how well we are capable, open and willing to constantly and proactively adapt our company's operating system. This goes hand in hand with a renewed sense of sustainability and social responsibility. All of this I call adaptiveness. Let me explain. In a world that is becoming increasingly increasingly complex and diverse, we must learn and structure our organizations in a way that allows us to read and to act on market signals that influence the features of our services or products. We must anticipate behavioral changes of our customers and end consumers. Just to focus on optimizing our processes of cutting costs, this will lead us straight into what I call the efficiency trap which happens to all successful companies, diverting too much of the energy to process optimization and not enough to understanding the world they are operating in. 
The globalization pendulum might oscillate in reaction to events of foreseeable and unforeseeable crisis, such as the Arabic Spring, Fukushima, the Ukraine crisis, 9-11, you might mention it. But it doesn't change the underlying dynamic towards the described equilibrium. Doing business in these times requires a viewpoint that is global and forward-looking. Creating scenarios is a daily task of every man in a management. So living up to that principle of adaptiveness, ladies and gentlemen, means to depart from traditional organizational and leadership dogmas. It starts with our employees. They are our senses of emerging trends and changes, equipped with the right tools such as predictive analytics. They can not only recognize patterns of consumption, but will also be able to propose the necessary adaptive changes. In order to understand how the world is moving, you need a lot in a lot of different senses. Empowerment and awareness is therefore one of the key principles of adaptiveness. Without waiting to be handed down the stone tablet from above, employees with management tasks will start adapting products and services in their field of responsibility. So it's an turning an upside down of an organizational self-understanding. And last but not least, sustainability and social responsibility. The fast pace of which consumption has increased over the last 30 years has gone hand in hand with extraction, distribution and usage of natural resources. In the face of hardening scientific data regarding global warming and the slow response by governments and international organizations doing business requires that companies acknowledge their respective social responsibility and care for the environment. Businesses like logistics have always been acting locally providing services that reduce the distance between markets that are geographically distant. Business with global presence are to be seen as the link between people, markets and products. More and more companies start to realize that you can not only take profit without giving back or caring for the communities in which you are either producing or selling your products or services. Ladies and gentlemen, let me summarize as follows with and for hypothesis. Globalization is driven by trade which connects people, cultures and desires. It's a fundamental system striving for an equilibrium. The journey to this equilibrium may be eternal, but it's definitely not a finite trend. Second, our current data does not support the notion of a backlash at all. The equilibrium principle includes that periods of overheated growth is giving way to a more sustainable growth and adjust the speed of further global integration, which does not change uh, its fundamental dynamic. Third, and second but last, doing business in a globalized world includes the responsibility to balance the use of natural resources at local level with our aims to generate profit. We have to live sustainability. And the last one, empowerment of employees in a much less centralized organization is the only way to become or remain an adaptive and therefore globally successful actor. Sorry for um, overrunning the time and thank you for um, um, boring me your ears. Thank you.